uh, as a loafer in cafes, and I must admit I'm a caffeine addict, um, I fall into that category of people that you do see in cafes, coffee shops, of observer. There's the person that goes to the cafe for a conversation, and there's the kind of person that goes there for uh, purposes of watching the world go by. I'm definitely the second type. I'm not really much of a socializer, although I do socialize, but generally I'm quite comfortable being by myself. But anyway, the, um, the interesting thing is how uh, you see people interacting in cafes, if you actually pay attention. I don't really pay that close attention, but over a period of 30 years sitting in cafes, one's, one notices a few things. Uh, I used to live in a city that was 40% French, 60% English. And when you listen in on the conversations that each side would have, they, they're markedly different. The English tend to talk about the things that they've done, the things that they plan to do, their past experiences and their future plans. Uh, the French will engage in that kind of discussion, but much more emphasized is this idea of the meaning of life. What, what is this all about? Uh, existential questions, uh, psychological, emotional questions, uh, philosophical, that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> the stereotype, the stereotypical phrase that we have here in Canada, being English, is all about doing, and being French is all about being. That's a generalization, but um, you know, I think there's a kernel of truth in it. And I don't think that this is peculiar to any particular group. It's just more emphasized or more pronounced among people of a certain culture. Uh, for example, uh, if you've ever spent any time in, around Israelis, Israelis actually seem to have this philosophical, existential... Uh, ethical sort of bent even more in, in an even more pronounced way than say the uh, the French Canadians or French people in general. The, everything gets reduced to a philosophical equation. That's all they ever talk about, um, and they fascinate me. I love spending time with Israelis for that reason. I, I love the way that they that they uh, analyze the world more or less constantly about what's the proper way to behave oneself in this world, <coughs> and. Um, I think that because this is kind of missing a little bit in the Anglosphere, this is where the internet comes in. Um, this is where uh, you know you can go to get your little uh, philosophical discussion in the Anglosphere is in the internet. You can't just walk down to the local coffee shop the way you can, I guess, in uh, in Montreal or in Tel Aviv or whatever. Um, and I think that this is uh, something that has come as an enormous breath of fresh air for me, is the, the, the ability to actually go out there and talk about this, that, and the other thing. It's also useful for people who aren't terribly social, like myself. I do have a social life. I do go out and socialize. But generally, I prefer my own company for whatever reason, probably because I'm an eccentric. Um, and um, <clears throat> it allows me, on the level that I prefer to keep it, to interact with people and to exchange ideas and get my mind working. I agree with you, Pyro, that uh, this kind of discussion is a wonderful sort of mirror to look into. Um, you can sort of bounce ideas off everybody else. When you know, I, I'm one of these people. I don't really see anything wrong with loving the sound of your own voice. That's obvious, but I'm kind of blatant about it. I like to listen to when things come out of my own mouth to see you know, what that actually jars inside of me and gets working. Because the way other people speak has the same effect on me. Why shouldn't I get influenced by my own prattlings? Um, it's a really useful thing, and it's an enjoyable thing. That's, to me, what this is all about. I don't really see that my ideas um, are something that I can actually spread. I don't really see that my points of view are really translatable um, or is are something that I can sort of spread around and diffuse uh, to make a better world. I, I don't know. It, it, it's, a, it's a tough call, and it always smacks of proselytism to me if you do that. And proselytism ends up being, I guess, um, sort of an admission of failure because if you're comfortable with your own ideas, you don't really have to spread them around among other people. Um, so yeah, the, uh, the, there's, we all have our motives for being here, and it's an interesting thing to sit around and sort of ponder why we're here. Um, and it's interesting that, uh, that you bring up Gary in this con context. I generally avoid any interaction with him, but I don't avoid dealing with him at all. 
I listen to a few of his videos from time to time, and I find them very instructive and, and useful. Um, but uh, again, as people would um, often say, I suppose, when you would approach one of the, you know, if you would approach Diogenes the cynic, he'd tell you to go to hell. Um, I tend to see Gary as kind of a disciple of Diogenes or someone cut from the same cloth. Um, or perhaps even more extreme, the Agoris of India, or the, the people that generally turn social convention upside down for its own sake, or not for its own sake, but for philosophical uh, purposes or ethical purposes or whatever. The left-hand kind of thinking, the darkness, um, which I do not have a problem with. It's just I don't really see how I personally can gain from interacting with these people. Um, but as far as considering it dangerous or abhorrent or anything like that? No, absolutely not. Uh, definitely not. I don't. I certainly don't see his point of view as uh, particularly dangerous or anything. I do believe that it's ideology driven. I believe that the circle of people that have formed around him, whether or not he wants them to be this way, are something of a cult, at least a cult of personality. But if that's what people want, what's wrong with that? I don't see anything wrong with that. Um, so, I, you know, I, I suppose it's probably overdue that I made this point clear. I don't really have anything against that group. I see them in a certain way. Well, they undoubtedly see me in a certain way. You're going to run up against people that you have that kind of abrasive relationship with on the Internet or in, in any philosophical discussion, in any philosophical circle, even if um, you're only sort of aware of each other. You have backbiting among philosophers, even among the best philosophers of them all. If you went down to the Agora in Athens in the period of classical philosophizing, you would often see the, the various acolytes or disciples of the various gurus of the age um, quarreling among each other and, and talking about each other behind their backs and smearing each other and writing graffiti on the wall about each other and that sort of thing. This kind of thing is inevitable. Um, and I suppose it's uh, some people engage in that kind of thing more than others. And some people, myself included, engage in it in a way where we try to be a little bit more subtle, but we're just as guilty of it as, any, of it as anyone else is. Um, it's just that that isn't the kind of thing that is, I feel in a certain way, is going to get me towards where I'm attempting to go with my philosophical musings. I just wanted to clarify that. And again, I think that when you tend to sort of be a bit of a, I won't say a shock jock, but if you're, if you're deliberately trying to be iconoclastic, and I understand that, I'm extremely iconoclastic myself, but if you're trying to be deliberately iconoclastic, that has a very seductive effect and you can get derailed by it. You can sort of say, oh, this is fun because I've gotten everyone's attention by being so iconoclastic and I stick to what I'm saying. There are many, many pitfalls, pratfalls um, along, the, uh, along the way when you're talking about philosophy and everything. What happens when you become popular? What happens when suddenly everyone thinks you're the cat's pajamas? That in itself has all kinds of uh, drawbacks. Um, <clears throat> so I think that it's helpful to talk about things, um, but it does get complicated when your audience gets bigger and when the quarreling tends to uh, take over instead of it just um, being just part of the general scene, the quarreling between people. When it starts to take over and when it starts to sort of become more important than the actual discussion itself, it's I think it's in the interests of all parties involved to just walk away from it. Because at the end of the day, you have to remember the first part. The first, why the heck are we here in the first place? Uh, well, I know why I'm here in the first place, or I believe that I do, I suppose. Um, and that is, again, that's to listen. And even if it means just listening to myself talk, it's a very, very useful thing. And in my opinion, a very pleasant thing. As for convincing anyone else, it's almost part of my philosophy that that's impossible or effectively impossible, or I don't know whether or not I've ever convinced anyone. <laughs> Thank you.